to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. So Colin, for the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about what we think an officer should be. And the logical follow-on to that discussion is then to figure out how do we count, how do we measure, how do we evaluate and compare these officers in order to help continue to develop them into the leaders and the commanders that we need. Yeah, for sure. When we talk about what an officer should be, there's a couple of different ways that we could have gone next, right? And eventually we'll get to all of these different topics, but there's how do you recruit that type of person? Then how do you develop that type of person? And how do you evaluate what you're producing, what you're developing? And all of this toward the end goal, like we were saying last week, is to eventually produce a joint force commander. And so you need to know that what you've established as the criteria is what you're getting. And so that's where we need to have this conversation is around evaluation itself. How do you measure the results of your input? Yeah. And we haven't really talked about this. You know, we've mentioned it a bunch of times because we know that the system that we use, the officer evaluation system, is undergoing quite a bit of change. But with the update to the Air Force Instruction 362406 and the release of the Airman Comprehensive Assessment Addendum with its 10 Airman Leadership Qualities, we're getting so close now that we need to start talking about it. We're starting to see pen hit paper and things are actually starting to move. And so it's time to address what has become the key component of the whole system, which is the Officer Performance Report or the OPR. Yeah. So today we'd like to start out our conversation by explaining what we think is the good, the bad, and the ugly of the current officer evaluation system. Now, here's an obligatory caveat for all of us. Reed, you and I, we are not experts, right? Yeah. We're just a couple of officers who have been in this system long enough to have both benefited from and be burned by it in some situations. And the reason for that is because no evaluation system is perfect and it's not going to treat everybody exactly the same and fairly every single time in every single circumstance. There just is no such thing as a perfect evaluation system. I mean, you can talk to any group of working professionals within an organization of some size and ask them about the personnel evaluation system and you're inevitably going to get some complaints that go along with it. No system is perfect. And that is exactly the case for what we have. Yeah, totally agree. So one thing in particular, we are not going to get into the real nuts and bolts, the nitty gritty about writing an OPR, because this is, in a sense, a very Air Force specific form of technical writing. And yeah, there's no other organization (laughs) that does anything like this. Yeah. And the spoken word is just not a good medium to have a discussion about technical writing. So we're going to talk in more generalities, more about the so what of what is the result of this super strange, unique form. We're just not going to go into the details. Now, we've already given an episode on how to write bullets, which we do think has got some value. And that's episode nine for those who want to check that out. So as we mentioned earlier, this is all part of a bigger evaluation system. The officer evaluation system is governed by AFI 362406. And it says there are three main purposes of this system. First, to communicate and provide meaningful feedback about performance standards, to establish a record of performance and promotion potential, and assist in making talent management making decisions. So the whole point of this system, and specifically the OPR, is to kind of capture what you've done and whether there's potential for you to do more. Yeah, for sure. The OPR is definitely the most important piece of that, but it's not the only thing. 
I don't know how many people know that there's actually much more to the evaluation system than the OPR. So we want to make sure that our audience is fully aware of all the different pieces, all the different forms that are part of the whole system. And so we've actually talked about some of these already, the Airman Comprehensive Assessment or ACA. We've talked about this. We just talked about it last week, right? That it's a central part of the evaluation system, but it's rarely used as it's intended, which is to be that tool for feedback that happens over the course of time. It's not a singular event so that the OPR is not a singular event, but feedback is an ongoing thing. And in addition to that is the new addendum, which was just recently released and is therefore untested. But that's going to be a critical part of the evaluation system going forward as well. In addition to the ACA, there are these education and training reports, which cover any time that an officer goes away from their duty station for professional military education or some sort of training. These reports are used to document that amount of time and, and can be used to writing of an OPR later on. Filling out this document is typically just a canned statement provided by one of the instructors. But if there is some sort of like distinguished graduate program, like there is a SOS, that training report or education report is going to cover that. Similar to that is what's called a letter of evaluation, where it can cover a period of time where you are away from home, but typically that's going to be for operations. So if you go TDY or deploy for an extended period, the letter of evaluation is going to cover that. And again, that is to help your home station commander and those that are responsible for the completion of your OPR. They can use those documents, the training report, the LOE, in order to strengthen and better inform your performance report. Reed, have you had any experience with training reports, LOEs? I mean, I know you've been TDY and a whole bunch for training and you've done a couple of deployments. I have, yeah. So, and like you said, LOEs are, can be super helpful when it comes time for your garrison commander to write your OPR. And I've also had some training reports. They're very useful tools. A couple things, you may get training reports at various stages in your career. And from what I understand, when those training reports are viewed as part of a promotion board or something like that, they're viewed kind of in a neutral fashion. It's not good. Yeah. It's not bad. It's kind of understood that this report means you are not doing the U.S. Air Force primary mission. You are doing an education or training primary mission. Right. And that's good, but it's not like negative thing. So that's important to recognize is that it's not going to hurt you. And then you already mentioned some of the ways in which a training report could be beneficial, depending on how you perform in that setting. Of note, I think it's important for us to point out for some of our ROTC, OTS, and USAFA folks, you do not get training reports from your accession source. That was a pretty regular question I would get from a lot of my prior enlisted students, yeah. is where is my training report? The bottom line is if you come out with bars, that's your training report. You met yep. the standard. And part of that purpose is we don't want students so worried that they don't take risks. We want them to stretch themselves, to test themselves. And frankly, do you want to see how many demerits you got at field training on your, you know, <laughs> on a training report in your official record? No, you don't. What you want is did you meet the standard or not? Yeah. By graduating, we show that you clearly met standards. So just something yep. to keep in mind for those students who are in those early accession stages. Yeah, that's a really good point. Thanks for sharing that. The training report in the LOE, these apply in various different circumstances to enlisted, to officer, but that's a one very unique case where we just don't do it. Yeah, exactly. So there's a couple more forms that make up this officer evaluation system. The first of which I have spent an untold, unholy amount of hours working, the promotion recommendation form. So just like it says, it is a form used for recommending you or not for promotion. It recently changed from 10 lines to two, and it includes a really important block called the senior rater endorsement, where you get a definitely promote or a DP, a promote P, or do not promote DNP, push. This document is a big deal. It is the <laughs> senior rater's way to communicate to the board whether or not you should be promoted. When I was a group exec, and I only had maybe 10 people that I was working, I cannot tell you how much time and energy went into these forms. 
Yeah, I remember when you were in the throes of this. I mean, you had PRF stapled on your forehead. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hours and hours and hours because we care about our members, right? Yeah. We want yeah. them, those that are worthy, we want them to get promoted. And we know that other officers are putting in just as much time and energy to get their folks promoted. And I mean, we're preparing them for gladiatorial combat, right? Yeah. Like this document is their career. How do you boil yeah. 10 years into 10 lines and say, boy, I sure hope this is good enough. <laughs> no, you work hard, right? You, you put in a lot of energy. I am so grateful it went to two, two lines. And those two lines are very, very strictly controlled. So there's yeah. a whole lot less that actually goes into it in a good way. I really think it's a true improvement. Yeah. And again, those two lines and what can or cannot be included within them can be found in AFI 3624-06. Yep. That's one of those like AFIs you don't know exists until you read it and then you realize how important it is. And there's a lot of really good info. If you're starting to move up in your career and you haven't read that document, it's time. Yeah. Now's the time. And it covers all these other documents that we've already been discussing. And the last one that we'll cover briefly because it's not super common, but it's going to probably start becoming common, is a retention recommendation form. So fairly similar to a PRF in that it's it's recommending you for something. And in this case, it's for retention. Colin, we've already talked about how 20-year high in retention right now, right? economic situations. Just yesterday, I was reading on Reddit about OTS boards getting delayed, classes being canceled and or you know um, decreased in size we're probably going to start seeing some folks getting reduced in force or rift here pretty soon. So, Yeah, for anybody who's paying attention to what's going on in the Air Force right now, you can read it in the tea leaves. Yep, absolutely. There's going to be some force management, some reduction in force, and the retention recommendation form is actually is going to be part of that. And you know, this actually makes me think about back in 2014 when there was that reduction in force then too. At the time, I was working as a squadron section commander, which for those who don't know, that particular position, squadron section commander, means that you are responsible for running the command support staff or the CSS. And I had just come back from a deployment. I was waiting for a flight command position to open up. And so I was asked to run the CSS. And it just so happened to coincide with the reduction in force, which meant that I got to spend some time with these retention recommendation forms, interestingly enough, that included my own. You know, I managed to stay in the Air Force through this, but it was really an eye-opening and interesting experience to do that. Certainly not one that I want to repeat again soon, but who knows what's going to happen here in the near future. Yeah. So why are we sharing all of this stuff? right? Why are we talking about all this? It's to help you understand how all of this fits into the officer evaluation system. But overwhelmingly, none of these things can hold a candle to the weight and gravity and just the oxygen sucking capacity of the OPR. It right. is the document, right? No document is more scrutinized, more shrouded in mystery, more written about, discussed, or more important to your career than this single two-page document that gets published once a year after untold hours bleeding back and forth, writing, fixing, adjusting, moving, happy to glad, yeah. you name it, right? And, um, and that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about that process. Yeah. The OPR is for sure a perennial hot topic. It's just something that because it is so important, we as officers care so deeply about the way that it's used and we want to improve it. And, you know, like we were saying before, there are ways and times that you will benefit from it. There are ways and times that it's going to hurt you. And with something that is so all encompassing, that's just the nature of the beast. And so, yeah, we need to talk about it because to talk about the evaluation system is to talk about the OPR. Yes, there are all those other documents, but this is the document. And so for those who are unfamiliar with it, we encourage you to go take a look at it. It is an unclassified form. You can get onto Google, search for the Air Force Form 707, look it up, open it up, take a look, and you'll see that it's a typical military form. There's you know, some blocks that need to be filled out with various types of information. 
it's pretty innocuous to look at, but having that visual in mind is going to be extremely helpful as we continue this discussion around the OPR. Totally agree. All right. So again, and before we get into the details here, just that caveat, we're doing the best we can. We are not experts in human relations or evaluation systems. We're just trying to point out some of the things that we can see and things that we've heard discuss and things we talk about. So let's start off with some of the good things about this document because it does have some really good traits, to be fair, right? Yeah, it does. First off, it's short. If this were a single blank page, we would be forced to fill it. Yeah. Because of the importance of this document, we would have to fill every single line. And so... It would be like a 1206. Oh, my word. Yeah, right? Like just this huge blank page, we would have to fill it. And because it's short, it ends up taking a little bit less time than it otherwise could. Even though it takes an unholy amount of time already, <laughs> yeah. it would be so much worse if it were much longer. So I think that's good that it's relatively short. So the next thing, it's very flexible. It's very applicable to a wide group of people in a lot of circumstances. It has three primary sections. The first is a job description section, and those are usually canned. Yeah. You usually get those, you literally steal them from the person above you who says, this is what you're putting here. I mean, they're very straightforward. Their importance is not too significant. It's more, honestly, to inform people who don't know what this type of job is. Yeah. Just a little bit for them. Yeah, because when the OPR goes to a promotion board, it's going to be looked at by people from outside of your career field who are trying to measure you and your performance, your responsibility against other officers from a different career field. Now, some of that has been streamlined with the introduction of the line of the Air Force promotion categories. But even within a single category, you know, take information warfare, for example, you've got Intel going up against weather, going up against public affairs. And, you know, these are not the same things and their job descriptions or job titles are going to look different. Yeah, exactly. And not to mention the OPRs are also used for other boards like professional military education board, like IDE or SDE in residence. And those are still a central selection board, yeah. not a promotion category like you just described. So yes, those four bullets, but they're canned. They're usually handed down from your predecessor. No thought. I mean, you literally copy paste, move on. And there's only four yeah. of them really quick. And then you've got two more sections. So you've got the Raiders overall assessment. Your Raider is your first frontline supervisor, the person who should be most often interacting with you daily. And, you know, their first responsibility is to lead, guide, mentor, and assist you in your role, right? Six bullets long. Yeah. That raider might be your commander, isn't always, depending on your level of responsibility within your unit. It might be, if you're a lieutenant, it might be a captain. If you're a captain, it might be a major. It's not always a squadron commander. It's not always somebody who is on G-series orders. Yep, exactly. And then there are four more bullets that make up the additional Raider overall assessment. For officers, this is generally their senior Raider, which is most often a wing commander. But again, this is all outlined in the AFI. It's all covered. When you show up at a unit, all of these things are understood and known. It's not going to be too much of a mystery to you. Yeah. But bottom line, you've got essentially 10 lines, 10 bullets. So because of that format, it's very flexible which is really good because as you know, we'll point out later in our episode, there are officers all over the place doing all sorts of crazy things, right? There are United States air force officers who work at the white house, their bosses at the Pentagon. Well, they don't see each other every day, but this document still works, right? They're still right. able to cover their performance. Another thing that's good is it's unclassified. For those of us who work in a classified environment, this is also a pain in the neck, but it's good that we don't have to, worry about classification and such when we're using this document. We can share it. We can share it with others. We can use it for, you know, our transition to the civilian world. It's good that it's unclassified document. That's an interesting thing that you bring up about using it to transition into the civilian world because the language, the way things are written, don't translate very well to the civilian world. And I'm not that far removed from my transition last year and using my collection of OPRs to inform a resume was difficult, to say the least. 
one to try and remember what I wrote, like trying to decipher yeah, my what own does it actually <laughs> mean. Yeah. <laughs> my own yeah. writing. <laughs> that was a challenge for sure. But then also to take what I did in an Air Force context and try and explain it in such a way that it makes sense to a civilian employer. It was hard to do. Sure. I'm not saying it can't be done. Obviously, I did it. Yeah. But no, and totally understood. But at least it's not illegal to move that. Right. That's what I'm getting at. Right. So <laughs> yeah, everything I do, I do on a classified system at a classified network. Ninety nine percent. Right. Right. And I actually have to get my evaluation reviewed by a classifying official in order to ensure that I'm not sharing anything that's classified. Can you imagine if all of my evaluations for 10 years were classified? <laughs> right. Like it would be almost impossible to. It's like sealing your fate to only ever work in the classified exactly. world. <laughs> yeah. So I'm actually grateful that it's unclassified. It makes it easier if I did want to use this stuff. So that's that. Yeah. One of the last things I want to point out here for something that's good is overall, the concept is very simple. It's very straightforward. It yeah. translates. Everyone understands what we're doing with the document. And I think that's a really good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There are some good things about the current situation, about the current system. But we do need to highlight that there are you know, some bad things and some of them are exactly what's good. I mean, first off, it's short. <laughs> I mean, how do you take everything that you accomplished in 365 days and boil that down into 10 lines? I mean, <laughs> and then it makes for some creative writing, I'll tell you. Oh, for sure. This thing has taken on a life of its own. Everybody likes to do it a little bit differently. There's no one right way to write an OPR. There's no one paved golden road to success with this report. But the fact that it is short, it is flexible, like you were saying earlier, really leads to some very interesting practices. And because there's no one right way, there's no standardized process, but we as a military, we as officers like to try and standardize things. We like to establish a repeatable, reputable, transparent process. Every wing is going to have then some sort of like writing guide that says this is how you will approach your performance report. And that, you know, the 11th wing is going to look very different from the 42nd wing, which is going to look very different from the fourth wing. You know, they're all going to be different based on wing commander preference, the way things are done within that particular major command. And so these things really just like take on a life of their own. And these writing guides, Colin, are sometimes like 30 and 40 pages. Right. And then there's an approved acronym list, which is another, you know, 20, 30 pages. And this is to write 10 lines. Right. So we've got dozens upon dozens upon dozens of guides and instructions and rules to write 10 lines. Oh, and it changes every time you get a new boss. Yeah. Which is all the time. Yeah. Whether that new boss is the wing commander and they have a new way of doing things or just that you get a new raider who has their own personal preference on how they like to approach the report. And that's not wrong. We wouldn't want to say that everybody has to do everything exactly the same all the time, but it does make things really complicated. Yeah, it ends up taking a whole lot more time than I think it needs. And so because it is so time intensive, because it is so difficult to capture all of these things that you do in a year's time in 10 bullets, we default to the things that are easy, right? We look for things that we can very easily measure. And so this comes down to the number of sorties, dollars saved, various percentages. And with any of these types of measurements, any times that there are numbers, you know, it's all about numbers, you know, counting is easy and bigger is better, right? And so we get hyper-focused on these very specific performance metrics, which may or may not actually represent your ability to perform as an officer, especially because so many of them are focused at the tactical level. Even when you are an 06 doing the highest level strategic work at the Pentagon, your OPR is going to be filled with very tactical looking things because numbers, right? Numbers. So... It's not a perfect document. There is good, there is bad. And we just wanted to make sure that 
you, our audience, were aware of some of these things. Yeah. So we've talked about these 10 lines, but the worst part of the OPR for me, and this is what I would categorize as the really ugly. Yeah. Is it actually only boils down to two lines and two blocks? Because what happens, right? What happens is that when you're going to a board, the officers doing this board, they don't have a ton of time to read through every line and translate every single acronym and, you know, read through the between the lines to figure out what it was you're actually doing. Right. They look at two lines, which are the last line of each section, right? So you've got your raiders section, then you've got your additional raider section. Yeah. They look at the last line of that section and they look for a stratification and they look for a push statement. So there's a strat and a push on each of those two lines, or not, which communicates something, right? Yep, yep. And then they look for the rank and position of your senior raider, and they look at your job title. And that's it. Yeah. So we do all this work. We write dozens of documents to explain the rules. We have acronym lists. We have writing guides. And it all really boils down to two lines and two blocks. Yep. And I think that is, for me, the worst part of the OPR. I will work so hard to close that white space at the end so that it looks like I cared and I put time and energy into this document. And then I'll send it with the last line blank and I will put strat question mark, push question mark. And I just hope that the leaders above me have deemed me worthy to give me a strat and a push. Yeah, so that's an interesting thing, right? That one, we are writing these documents ourselves. You are writing your own evaluation, except for the two lines that actually matter. Exactly. Yeah. And you send that up to your rater and then onto your senior rater, your additional rater, and then it ends up with the senior rater. And you don't know what you're going to get back. And so when you do finally get it back, where do your eyes go? Straight to the bottom left corner of those two blocks. Because yep. that's where your strat is. Or maybe not a strat. Exactly. And therein lies your destiny, is in that line. So, yeah, that is my big, ugly statement about the OPR. For sure. So, what are we going to do about it, Reed? That's the hard part. <laughs> I mean, do we leave it as it is? I mean, do we accept that we've got this big, ugly problem staring right back at us? Or do we have some ideas on how we might fix it. I mean, can you fix it? No evaluation system is perfect. So yeah. do we just accept it as it is? Or do we try and change some things? We know that headquarters Air Force is planning on changing some things. They've been signaling this for years, right? Yeah. And the updates to the AFI and now the new ACA addendum, the 10 airman leadership qualities, these are all pretty big signals that things are changing with the OPR, but to what and why? Yeah. And we have to do better. And that's why we're having this conversation today. And it's something that I take a lot of pride in for our service is that never ending push to get better. And we have to have that conversation because we measure what matters and because what we measure becomes what matters. We have to talk about this Yeah, because this OPR is how we measure our officers and therefore how we measure matters a great deal. So instead of just admiring it, we're going to talk about some things that we would like to see in a future evaluation system. All of our ideas are not perfect. We absolutely accept that. There are things that we'll talk about at the end. You know, we'll do a good, bad, and ugly of our proposed solutions, but we want these things to be considered. And we also want to hear your ideas. So if any member of the audience, if you have some things you'd like to hear or see in the future OPR, not that Colin and I have any sway or influence in that in any way, but we think this conversation matters. And so we'd like to hear from you as well. Yeah. I mean, this goes back to the discussion that we've had multiple times that we decide as members of the club who gets to be part of the club. And this is part of that process because yes, there are those other forms, the promotion recommendation form, the LOE, the retention form, right? But this still going forward, regardless of the system that we end up with, the performance report or whatever they end up calling it is going to still be central and the most critical piece of it. And so we need to get this right or some version of what's right. And we play a, a part in that. The conversations that we have here, the way that we use it, we own this. Yeah, 
Absolutely. And we talked about, you know, I kind of hinted at this idea, Colin, and we covered it. What we measure ends up mattering a great deal. And so we have to talk about, well, what are we measuring? Yeah. Right now, the current OPR is so open-ended and so flexible that what we end up measuring is your stratification against your peers. I mean, that's basically what the document is boiled down to. Yep. But what is captured in that? It's a lot of things and it's not written down anywhere. And we've already discussed how we think it needs to be focused on character. It needs to be focused on competence and connection. Those are the things we think matter. And we think that needs to be measured in some form or fashion on this document. And, oh, by the way, we also talked about this last week, your capacity and propensity and ability to succeed in command. Yeah. I think all of those things need to be captured and we need to count them. We need to measure them in some form or fashion because these are the sources of special trust and confidence, which is the whole point of the commission. Yeah. The scope and expectations of your character, competence, and connection, as well as your propensity for command, will grow in size and in intensity. We've talked about this, Colin. A JFC needs to have a whole lot more ability to connect than a flight commander does. He or she is connecting with a much broader, much more diverse, much more challenging group of people than a flight commander. But we've got to evaluate those things, and it has to be explicit. Yeah. And to be fair, Reed, we wouldn't need a new evaluation system and an OPR in order to measure those things. It would just need to be stated and clear and coherent to the rest of the force and to the officer corps that those are the things that we care about and that we are going to measure our character, competence and connection and potential for command. We could do that with the current system. It would just need to be outlined as such. But even so, we do think that there are some other changes, not just in what we measure, or what we value to the current system that are worth discussing. For example, the timelines involved, the dates on the calendar for when things get measured. That's something that we think there's some pretty easy fixes to the current system. You know, for example, the the OPR needs to be looked at as less of an event, but more of a process. And the ACA, the Airman Comprehensive Assessment, or whatever tool for providing feedback becomes a much more integral part of that. What you see on that bottom left corner of the OPR should not be a surprise to you because you've had feedback along the way that you know going into your OPR, a pretty good idea of what's going to end up as a stratification if it still continues to be part of the OPR or any of those other eight other lines and the accomplishments that are included, you should already know that. Your boss should already know that. I would say that even your wing commander, your senior raider should already know some of those things because the evaluation of performance is something that's happening constantly. And there's that communication back and forth, up and down the chain all the time, instead of just that one instance, that one report that happens sometime within the calendar year. Yeah, totally agree. And something that our enlisted force has been using for a while now that I think would help in this is what we call a static closeout date or a SCOD. Mm -hmm. Static closeout date, what does that mean? That means all people at a certain rank, their report is due at the same time. Why is this going to be helpful? Colin, understanding when your OPR is due ends up taking a ton of time and energy. Yeah. If you've been supervised for more than 120 days, and your supervisor leaves, change positions, or you change position or something or else, you have to do an OPR. I've had OPRs close out with barely 120 days of supervision. Yeah. And so now, instead of boiling a year into 10 bullets, I'm boiling three months into 10 you're, bullets. You're not boiling, you're stretching. Yeah, you are trying to do everything you can to find out how to fill out this document. Every time a senior leader moves, they have to close out Dozens, yeah. dozens of OPRs at all ranks. And we just spend so much time, so much admin time trying to just keep track of who has an OPR due and when. It's ridiculous. And just having a static closeout date would get rid of so much extra admin time that we would 
be able to stop focusing on, well, where's this paperwork and focusing more on providing meaningful feedback. That's one big thing, right? We don't want so much of an admin lift with the system that we end up doing the system for the system and not for the purpose it was created. Right. And that's a bit of where we are right now. I think we spend so much time worrying about commas and dashes and white spaces and F slash and all this other garbage that we end up not doing actual feedback, which is the whole point of the system. Yeah. Yeah. I would love to see a uh, Scott implemented. Again, it's not perfect. There is no perfect solution, but my hope is that it would do exactly what you're saying that would free up some of our time so that we could provide meaningful feedback, which is a stated purpose in the AFI for the whole evaluation system. Yeah, totally agree. Next, I think it's good to point out like who, who should be doing these evaluations. And Colin, you've proposed a really interesting idea here and I like it a lot. So I'm gonna actually, I want you to talk about this one because I think you really had a good idea here. Yeah, okay. So we talked last week about the things that matter are the character, the competence and the connection of an officer. And those three things need to be in place in order for us to have the special trust and confidence needed to receive a commission and then to develop your ability to eventually serve as a commander at some level, hopefully one day as a joint force commander, because that's the whole point and purpose of this, right? And so when it comes to evaluation of those three things, character, competence, and connection, I had the thought that those three things are best evaluated by different groups of people, in my mind, are the stakeholders for that particular characteristic or that quality. So you take competence for an example, because it's the most direct transfer from our current system. Exactly. Who is the stakeholder for your competence as an officer? Well, it's whoever cares the most that you are competent. And that should be the person and competent in what, right? Competent in executing the mission. And the person that owns the mission is typically going to be your commander. So your raider, your additional raider, the senior raider, those are the stakeholders of your competence as an officer toward the mission. But then who are the stakeholders for the other areas for connection and character? Well, for connection, it's not a huge jump to realize that it's the people that you work with. Those relationships and interactions that you're having on the daily basis in order to accomplish the mission, right? And so those people are going to be your peers, your subordinates. And I think that these people should have some say in your evaluation. They should be able to rate on you, provide some sort of meaningful feedback, and then have some responsibility towards your performance report. I don't know exactly what that would look like, whether they would use the same thing as the commander for measuring competence, or if they get other questions altogether, they provide other substance. But you can see how having that group of peers or your subordinates having some say would be really valuable, right? And then the last piece of it, who is the stakeholder for character? Is it the commander? Is it the other group of people? I actually think that the best person to provide that piece of information is yourself. I think that for the feedback and for the performance report, there should be a section where you as an individual get to measure yourself, declare your own worthiness, as it were. And, you know, you could say that we are doing all three of these things in the current system. I mean... I write my own OPR, so do you. And so I'm declaring my own worthiness that way, right? Yeah. The commander clearly has a responsibility in the current OPR. Yeah, we sign our OPR. So we are in effect saying this is in fact, you know, true and legal and good. And so we do that to some degree, but I love this idea that you brought up of declaring your own worthiness. Yeah. It takes a special kind of sick person to answer the questions that you could imagine and just straight up lie. Yeah. Right. I think those are few and far between. And so I loved this idea. Yeah. I just totally, totally, I'm buying Colin. I just came up with it, you know, within the last week, I haven't fully fleshed it out, but I can see that there's some real value to splitting up the evaluation of an officer into these three categories, measuring their character, competence, and connection by three very different 
people or groups of people with very different responsibilities toward that particular officer. And then let's not forget the ultimate purpose of all of this, which is to measure command. I think that there should be somewhere on the OPR where there's a statement, probably by the first 06 in your chain of command, who says, this is the level of command that you are ready to take on, whether that's flight command, squadron, group, wing, whatever, right? There should be some sort of statement about that because commanders are the stakeholders for future commanders. Absolutely. And I love that idea. Something else that you pointed out is how this system would kind of create a check and balance. It would be unlikely for one of these groups to be very, very different in their evaluation of you in one category. Right. And if it was, if that did happen, I think that would be a very important thing to capture and then address and look at. You know, if your commander thinks you're fantastic and you say that you're an amazing human being, but then all of your peers and subordinates can't stand you, okay, hey, we've identified some challenges that we need to address. And so I really like that idea that there's checks and balances kind of built in. And I think there's some real goodness that could come out of that. Yeah, or another example, maybe you've got a commander who really just doesn't like you. Well, hopefully through a system like this, that gets highlighted and it gets balanced by two other pieces of this evaluation, yourself and your peer group who are saying, yeah, I'm actually a pretty good person. Yes, that officer is actually a pretty good person. And that commander just has them under the gun all the time. Yeah, yeah. We recognize there's some, you know, intricacies that we'd have to sort out through this. And and we'll talk about that later. But yeah, I really think there's a lot of good things in here. One thing I think we'd have to point out, this would have to be some sort of rubric based, you know, check the box kind of thing. Because if you had to have all of these people write things, it would just get so ungainly and huge from an admin lift. So it would just take so much coordination. It's already hard (laughs) and we're only moving it between, you know, three or four people. So, but yeah, I love this idea. It it literally just needs to be a check a box kind of thing. Yeah. Is this officer outstanding, excellent, satisfactory, below satisfactory in these particular categories? And they could just check one, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that leads us perfectly into the how. I really think there's got to be some sort of rubric involved I recognize the system benefits of it being flexible right now, but because it's flexible, it takes a life of its own and it does its own thing and it's created all these other issues. And I just think we've got to get some of that out. I think we can have a little bit of both, you know, a little bit of writing, a little bit of customization, but I think the more rubric involved, the more streamlined the whole process is going to be, you know, maybe we adapt from the ACA, you know, maybe that's kind of the springboard and therefore the ACA addendum then becomes, you know, that constant tool that we can use. And so, as you mentioned, when you get to the annual report, there should be no surprise. Um, Something that I like too about a rubric is it could have a potential of normalizing everything. In other words, driving everyone to the middle. Yeah. And so let's think about this way. If you have to justify departures from the norm, meaning let's say the system is, let's say one to five, And let's say one being the best, five being the worst, or even flip it around because bigger numbers are better, right? Right. And we want to return to the firewall five era. There you go. Yeah, let's do that. Let's say that everyone gets a three, but you have to justify a four or a five and likewise justify a two or a one. Because I think humans are inherently lazy. We're all great, but I think we're inherently lazy. I think most people will end up getting a three because that's the default. Yeah. And if you have to do a lot of work, and I mean a lot of work, to justify a departure from the norm, I think when you have that number one guy or gal, you're going to put in the work because they deserve it. Yep. And so then the five actually has value because you've got the backup paperwork. You're like, oh, wow. Yeah. So this person got their number one. Wow. Look at all this stuff. Yeah. Okay. I I can see that. And likewise, if they're a dirtbag, you're going to have to do the same amount of work I think that also has a propensity to hopefully normalize the whole situation. Again, just my thoughts. More on the how. I think it needs to be in plain English. Please. Like legible sentences that you could get any fifth grader off the streets and say, can you read this sentence, please? And they would have at least some understanding of what we're talking about. Yeah, that right there (laughs) is so huge just to get away from this crazy way that we try to fill that white space. Yeah. Can we just, I mean, 
Just stop it. <laughs> Just stop it. Just stop. We do this to ourselves, Colin. We did this to ourselves. Every time I sit down to fill out an OPR, I say that out loud. We did this to ourselves. And we can change it. So let's do that. You take a deep breath. I know. <sighs> okay. Yeah. There's some also discussion about waiting, waiting, and then attributing the rating you give to others to the rater. The Navy uses this model. And so I've talked about it with some Navy, senior Navy leaders before. It's still a little mysterious to me, but bottom line, as a rater, you end up developing like your score. So let's say I always give pretty middle of the road ratings, then I'm seen as kind of like a middle of the road rater. And so if I give a top mark, it carries more weight okay. than someone who's a soft grader who always gives high marks. And so if you move to a new unit and you see your commander's rating, you could say, oh, well, this guy's a softie. He gives everyone top marks. So if I get a top mark, it kind of doesn't have the weight that it could otherwise. Likewise, if you have a super hard grader who hardly ever gives top marks, and this is cumulative over their entire career, yeah. then if you get, you know, like above 50% or something, you know, you're in the top half, it carries more weight. Yeah. I think there's some value there. You know, when I talked to this Navy 06 about the system, they pointed out some interesting challenges and problems with it. In particular, retiring commanders, they kind of don't care at that point. Right. Because they're not going to continue. And so they'll be like, hey, you want a top mark? I'm a hard grader. You know, and, <laughs> and right. it, it, so it's like, oh, that, that could lead to some scary situations. But I think there's something worth considering there where you are held accountable for the ratings you give. And if someone ends up being a dirtbag, I think that needs to be reflected in some way on the raider. Yeah. Just an interesting idea that I had as you were talking, you know, retired officers can very easily be brought back on active duty. And if there is a situation like that where tough grader gave top marks to a toxic leader, bring them back on active duty and I don't know. Have a little court martial? I don't know about court martial, but, you know, have some sort of consequence for the poor choice that they made on their way out you know again there's no perfect solution yeah and we're not saying that you know it's a commander's fault that someone else made a bad decision but you and i colin have seen dirt bags get good marks yeah and everyone knows they're dirt bag but there's no consequence for giving them those top marks yeah which i think we'd like to fix all right colin what do you <laughs> we're it's getting real tense right now because we're moving into the most controversial <laughs> section of the OPR, the strat. Ugh. We're going to talk about the strat. Reed, do you want strats to stay in the OPR? Do you still want that to be part of the system? Just give me straight up yes or no. Yes. Okay, why? Because we have a lot of people and we have to make evaluations about a lot of people all at once. And you think the strat is the way to do that? I think it is a way. Okay. I don't know that it is perfect, but I think we could do a lot to really improve it, to simplify significantly. I think it's got to be there because if we don't put it in, here's what I'm worried about. If we don't categorize it and formalize it and make it have to follow a very specific model, we are going to find a way. Airmen are brilliant and creative. They're ingenuitive. They're going to find a way to somehow get a counting mechanism in there that we can't control. Whether it will be how many exclamation points. Oh, if there's 10 exclamation points, they're the best. And if there's nine, they're not as good. And they're, I'm, you think I'm joking, Colin. <laughs> no, I'm laughing because I know you're not joking. <laughs> yes, it's true. So I think yes, but I think it needs to be formalized. I think it needs to be much more narrow. I think, for example, that the strat should be a block. And there should only be a very narrow set of categories that you are stratified. I think it needs to be your rank or peer group, period. So what are peer groups? Company grade officers, field grade officers. And I could see a section for squadron commanders and up, commanders at the squadron level and up to include their vice. But I think that's it. I do think you could have some rank strats, but those would be below the peer strats. Yeah. But either way, I think we need to define the category and I think everyone gets one. Oh, okay. Because right now... I think it's top, it's like top 10, 15%, maybe 20%, depending. I think you need to give one to everybody. Okay. So you have a peer group of a hundred officers. Yep. You want someone to have an OPR that says you are 100 out of 100. Yes. Because I want to force leaders to own that decision. 
Because what happens if we only strat the top 10%? That's all we think about. That's all we look at. That's all we develop. That's all we track. You know, that big Excel document that I told you, Colin, that I would end up printing out and taping together as I'm sitting there at, you know, 9 p.m. at night, the day before the strat meeting, I'm thinking I, I went to school and got a master's degree in cell biology to do arts and crafts late at night. <laughs> right. That's what I'm thinking as I'm doing this. We were only accounting for the top 15 percent. The bottom 85 percent of officers were not on that document. And so I don't think they're getting developed. I don't think they're being considered. I don't think the Raiders are going, how do I get this person out of 100 out of 100 if I can? I don't think they're thinking about them. And so that's why I think everyone gets one. I think it would force hard conversations. Yeah. Colin, you and I have been there. Yeah. I know you've been there. Yep. You get that cadet in your queue, but at the end of the term, whatever, for me, it was the end of the class, final feedback. And they would say, hey, sir, so I noticed that you gave me a bottom third ranking. And they say, Why? And then you have to go, huh, why did I do that? I want those conversations to happen. Yes, I want those conversations to happen too. I'm just going to change it a little bit. Having that conversation with a bottom third ranking is usually not that difficult. That person is there for a reason. Yeah. It's the fuzzy middle that that's fair. I worry about. Totally fair. Totally fair. And that's what my hope would be with however our system or whatever the system ends up being is it provides some transparency and some ability to have that conversation with the fuzzy middle. Why is, you know, Lieutenant so-and-so, why is Lieutenant Snuffy ranked number 50 out of 100? Yeah. I want to be able to explain that. And, you know, maybe, Colin, it's kind of like a hybrid where we've got top, middle, bottom, third. The top third all get actual numerical strats. The middle and bottom don't. But you still have to have the conversation because you've said you're in the middle third. They're going to say, well, what do I need to do? How close am I? You know, that kind of conversation. So I'm willing to have different ideas about how this is implemented. But what ends up happening now is, did I get a strat or not? That's the first question, right? Right. And if you don't, there's no conversation, Yeah. basically. You know, it's like, oh, I didn't get one. Okay, well, I guess I'll work up my resume and like get ready to move on. I mean, that's kind of the way yeah. it's discussed. And we can't have that. We need to develop everybody, not just the top 10%. Yeah. And number 100 out of 100, if there's an opportunity to rehabilitate them, we have a responsibility to do that. And if there isn't, then we need to provide the justification to release them from the Air Force. Yeah. And I think right now the system as we have it, it's, well, do better next year. And we move on. You know, well, I didn't get a strat, you know. I don't know who got the strats. I don't know. You know. There's so much that goes into these things that we end up not talking about it. Yeah. You want to throw a grenade into a room, proverbially, start talking <laughs> about strats with a bunch of officers. Well, we're, we're doing Holy it right now. I know. I know. <laughs> just, just, you know, if you're in a big group and just say something like, so-and-so got a strat last year or something, you know, just, just do it and just watch <laughs> the awkward stares, the faces flush, you know, like it's a big deal. And because it's so important, I think we need to formalize it in some way. Yeah. And I think that formalizing it should also include automating it. You know, I do think that there is a place for subjective measurement, but I think that that should happen elsewhere for this evaluation, maybe done by those different stakeholders, the different categories. But the results of that assessment of those evaluations should feed the gonculator and spit out some number that does not get to be chosen by the raider or a senior raider. It should just be automatic. Yeah. And on that, for the love of all that is holy, this has got to be a web-based system. <laughs> yeah. Colin, if I have to, uh, I'm going to say something I shouldn't. So <laughs> we make this so hard. We make signing and pushing and moving these things so hard. Please give me a URL. I'll even accept that it's CAC enabled and I have to use my CAC, even though that would still kill me a little bit. Just make it all web-based. Yeah. And if I wanted to, I could print it out. Sure. But good grief almighty, the amount of flail that goes into just moving this document around. We spend so much time and energy. And not to mention the documents that have to accompany it. Usually when you route an OPR, 
you have to send the last three OPRs, fitness report, a surf, uh, anything else I'm missing, Colin? A justification letter, any supporting LOEs or training reports. Yeah. And all of these, all of these documents are held in different places. Yeah. So you have to end up downloading them all. And then, oh, remember how every wing has different rules? The order in which these documents appear, you know, sometimes they are reverse chronological. Sometimes they're, you know, chronological. Sometimes they want the fitness report first. Sometimes they want it last. And so you'll spend hours creating a PDF to attach, to route with this document on a system that sometimes isn't. I, I'm just, no, stop. <laughs> stop it. Why, why do we do this? We spend so much time. And it takes away from time from doing what the whole point and purpose of this, which is to give feedback. Yep. And so what ends up happening? You get a one line email. Hey, your OPR is ready for signature. Good job. You're like, oh, sweet. And you download it immediately looking for the strat. Yep. You got the strat or you didn't. You sign it and that's it. Come on. If you can we sign it. Yeah. Oh, don't. I'm, <laughs> let's move on. Okay. No, absolutely. I agree with you, Reed. We need to remove the barriers to the success of the evaluation system, whatever it looks like. There's no reason why we couldn't move this into some sort of cloud-based provider service that manages all the access, the routing, the version control. Everything. This is not hard. <laughs> not hard and not even expensive. I mean, yeah. we, we could save ourselves so much time, so much money, so much headache just by moving this into the cloud. There's no reason yeah. we couldn't do it. If I can't do the next OPR on my phone. You're going to quit? I No. <laughs> I'll just die a little inside. All right. So we've talked about a bunch of things here. We know there are problems. And hey, first and foremost, we want you guys to give us feedback. Audience, chime in. What are things that you've seen that aren't working? What are things that we missed? You know, what are some problems with the things we proposed? A couple things we can see. Some good ideas here to address the three C's. We think the current system doesn't address character specifically. We think it covers competence really well. I don't think it addresses connection at all. And we think having those three things be a central tenant of the next OES would be a good thing. Yeah. And then also the current system doesn't provide a direction. I mean, there are push statements, but what is the ultimate purpose of it? It should be command, right? And using our suggestions here to measure, evaluate the three C's with that push statement or that recommendation for command is developing you toward becoming a joint force commander, potentially, right? Yeah. Our recommendation here gives the OES a goal, you know, some sort of end result down the line. Exactly. Something else we really like about this is the inherent checks and balances from multiple stakeholders. Right now, you have one God to please. <laughs> and it's your Raider and senior Raider, right? And so if I have to stab my peers in the back, so be it, right? Colin, you and I have seen that. Yeah. We have seen people stab their peers in the back in order to get ahead. We feel like that would be a little bit less likely if we had this check and balance, multiple stakeholders involved. Yes, that opens up a whole lot of admin queep, which is something we've been talking about trying to get rid of. So that's, you know, a little bit of a challenge, but something to consider. Yeah, for sure. I like the idea of using a rubric for those multiple stakeholders to try and decrease the admin lift. And my hope is that those rubrics would also, like we discussed, give shape and conversation to the fuzzy middle of where most people are honestly going to be. And where the cut lines are drawn, right? We've talked about in previous episodes. The cut lines are drawn right in the middle where there's the least definition of who's on the correct side of the line. And so, yeah, I like that idea. This one's good and bad, right? I like the idea of normalizing it using a rubric and kind of forcing everyone to the middle, but it makes it really time intensive for both the good and the bad. Right now, you spend the same amount of energy and time for your worst officer as you do your best. Yeah. And I think we ought to change that I think, again, if people are inherently lazy, it's going to be hard to kick out somebody because you're like, oh, it's a lot of work, right? It's, you know, and so maybe we'll just result in giving them average marks. So, yeah, I'm a little on the fence with this one, but I like the idea of forcing conversations about departures and really categorizing, you know, those good and bad folks. Yeah. Again, it could go either way. The most important thing here is that we provide reason 
and a process for having those conversations, not just one time, but over the course of time within a evaluation period. Yeah. And another good thing about this would be that static closeout, that there is a very set and defined time period wherein those conversations need to take place. Yeah. Yeah. I'd really like that. You know, some other things that maybe aren't necessarily good about some of our ideas, try as we may, Colin, we still can't really define character. It's still kind of a squishy topic and, and that's hard. And we know that. And if we make it a central part of our, you know, future OES, I'm not certain we have a really good way of measuring it yet. And so I recognize that as a shortcoming of our system. Yeah, I mean, here we have been spending all these hours talking about the importance of character, but you and I haven't really defined it yet. And so if it stays undefined, it will eventually end up as something that's easy to measure. Did they get a DUI? Did they do drugs? How many hours did they spend in jail? You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, which for the overwhelming majority of officers, they're fantastic. And so it would end up being kind of like a given. Yeah. I don't, and maybe that's not bad. But it shouldn't be just a given. Yeah. I mean, yes, it is a given. It's part of the cost of entry just to become an officer and to stay one. But we really want to highlight those who are of high moral character and are continuing to develop it. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe that's the thing. It's like, uh uh-oh, there's a departure from the expectation here. And we have it physically. You have to, yeah, I don't know. That's something that we've recognized as, as a little bit of a weakness. And yeah, if we could figure out how to do this multiple stakeholder things without taking and increasing admin requirements, I would love to see that happen. But, you know, as it is, the current system takes so much time. Yeah. We say that the OES is supposed to be this never ending system. Just the OPR is a continuous and ongoing situation. Yeah. I mean, Colin, we've been there. You start working on it a quarter before it's due. Right. Three months before it's due. And then it gets the wing or wherever it goes and you sign it like five or six months after it was due. Right. That's like eight months, nine months sometimes. Yeah. You sign your previous one as you're beginning to write your next one. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it it ends up taking a life of its own, as we've said before. So we've got to reduce that admin load and adding more pieces, more fingers to the pie. I'm not sure if that will reduce that, but it's something I, I like the idea of thinking about it for sure. Well, where does that leave us, Colin? I mean, we're not experts. We're not at half A1 right now. You know, we're throwing solutions out there to the world. We don't know if our system would be any better or worse than the current one. And so where that leaves us is we need people to give us feedback. Yeah, it would be great to hear from people up at headquarters Air Force and have them pull back the curtain and tell us exactly what's going on. But I don't know that they're going to do that. They may not have the time or the ability. You know, They're working on the OPR right now and it may not be ready for public release. Right. But that doesn't mean that we can't have this conversation. And we invite that from our audience. We would love to hear your thoughts on the current system, on our proposed ideas here. What are some ideas that you have that would help to improve the officer evaluation system and not just the OPR. You know, let's take it as a whole, again, looking at it as a process and not a particular event or one single form. We want to hear all of that from you. Yeah. And to think about the second and third order effects, what unanticipated behaviors would we be driving in the creation of this system or the idea that you'd propose? You know, Colin, I've said before, I think we need more economists, you know, people who are experts in studying human behavior. Yeah. Yeah come and study this kind of stuff as it impacts us all. And, you know, just get back to that why. We need to get this right because the American people deserve an Air Force who's ready, trained, and equipped to fight their wars. And if we're spending all this time to evaluate people, it should be to that end. And so they deserve it. Your airmen deserve it. You deserve it. Your leaders deserve it. And so let's try to make good rules of the club that we're in. That's what I'm going to leave us with today. Yeah, absolutely. Our conversation is not done on the evaluation system or on the process of creating the officers that we need. And so next week, we're going to bring you a discussion around how do we bring in these types of officers, those who have character and competent, that have character, competence and connection. And then we'll also get into the development of that and Again, all of this is going to be couched under the conversations that we've already had last week and then here today of what matters and then how do we measure it. 
Absolutely. Thank you for joining us. And with that, that concludes this week's episode of Commission Ed. Commission Ed.